this guy that you probably never, you might have heard of him because you're more into sports, but most people probably haven't heard of him, who's a shooting coach and he's the shooting coach for Steph Curry. And you're like, why, why does like one of the best shooters ever need a shooting coach? Anyone who takes something seriously is probably going to invest in that, whether that's a coach or, or something else, but they have skin in the game. Like I'm sure Curry's paying his coach quite a bit of money. If Steph Curry was constantly thinking about about his form. He probably wouldn't make very many three three pointers, right? He'd be like, is my elbow here? Uh, I release the wrist at this degree and what, right? There, there's so many parallels with, with the work we do. I used to think people who hired executive coaches and stuff, they were complete idiots, right? A waste of their time. And then now that I think about it more, it's like, wow, I am so busy executing in this business. Having someone else come in and say, have you thought about doing this? And like, this is an inefficiency. If I'm focusing so, so hard on it, like I don't see the inefficiencies. I just see the work in front of me. Matt Harrison, thank you so much for coming on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for letting me come on. Yeah, no problem. So obviously you're a renowned author, uh, a trainer. You've uh, you know worked in a lot of communities. You've you've produced a lot of incredible content in the space and add a lot of value to the space. I'm really interested in the story behind where it all started, how you got into this field. Um, and I love starting with where you first got interested in data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, my first job out of school was a data job and I wasn't necessarily looking for it. My background is I have a computer science degree. But the, the first company that I worked for was basically doing search, natural language processing. And uh, my first task working with them was using Python to basically make a tool that would look at documents and tell you what terms or words in the document were important. So this was before uh, most of the tools that we have now were out. And, and so we were integrating Python with proprietary libraries that would do uh, a lot of the functionality that you would have these days. So uh, that was kind of mind opening to work with really smart people and and uh, work on some cool technology. And from then, from that, I, I went to a company doing open source software. I uh, like I said, I learned Python, used it a lot, and I really liked Python, even though at the company that we were at, it wasn't really a supported language to say. And so at that time around 2000, there were various layoffs going on. And uh, I felt like I survived all these layoffs probably because I was just probably the cheapest employee because I was just a fresh grad. And um, got a job doing open source software and uh, doing a lot of Python, uh, doing more search, and uh, then eventually started a, a boutique uh, reporting company and had the chance to uh, basically create uh, a lot of uh, optimized data warehousing tooling for uh, a vertical that we were working with. And at that point, uh, read a lot of papers, worked with like columnar databases like MonetDB uh, and um, implemented uh, uh, basically an OLAP cube on top of uh, uh, databases with, with Python at the time. Uh, soon after we did that, I was at PyCon and heard about pandas and um, thought, okay, uh, there's a lot of overlap between like the tooling that I'd created and what pandas do does. And so um, at, at that point in time, I was working for a hardware company doing some statistical modeling, predictive uh, modeling for software, uh, for hardware. They were making storage devices. So we were uh, modeling when these devices would fail and uh, pandas turned out to be really useful there um so a, a lot 
during that same point in time, because I was pretty involved in the Python community, I was running the Utah Python user group and speaking at a few conferences, doing tutorials. And um, I did a tutorial um, that uh, I had done at a conference. And then I uh, thought, okay, uh, let's uh create well i i was offered to to do the tutorial again at a different conference and i thought instead of just rewriting my slides i'd write a book and so long story short i wrote a book and uh just being out there eventually led to uh incoming interest in people wanting training and uh support around these things and so that's uh, I guess the, the the five minute tell of my journey from uh, computer science person to person who is now doing training in data science, Python, uh, engineering. Uh, so that that's sort of how I got to where I am. I mean, it seems like a lot of really powerful things happened in communities. You mentioned PyCon, and you know, we actually met at a meetup that you created. You know, something interesting to me also is that you, you had mentioned that you're a little bit more on the introverted side. And I'm, I, I'd love for you to, to touch on how those communities might be just as valuable to people who, is intro, who are introverted um, compared to, you know, like I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm like very extroverted. Uh -huh. And how, um, you know, whether it's organizing them or whether participating in them, it's, it's valuable to, to all people. Sure, yeah. Um... So I have a talk that I call consulting for introverts, um, which is like, you know, a lot of people, they're smart, but they're like, I don't want to talk to people. I'd rather just look at people's feet rather than look at their face sort of thing. And so how, how do you get someone who who's smart and can help you? How does that person get to the point where they can like do marketing, actually tell someone what they're doing, that sort of thing? And um I kind of look at it like in that talk, I talk about like this onion ring model of participation. And, and maybe it's best to look at that maybe like from an open source point of view, where uh, in open source, you have like the person who created the project and oftentimes they will run it or at least will will, will be like the benevolent dictator for life of that project. And then uh, so so they'll have a deep knowledge of that. Uh, then around that, you'll have like contributors, people who are, will support that. They also know the project. Maybe they don't know every aspect of it, but um, they are able to make commits to it. And then around that, you sort of have people who are doing pull requests, like um, pushing code, but they're not contributors per se. And then around that, you have like people who are uh, reporting bugs. Um, and then around that, you have people who are like using the product and maybe reading the documentation. And then beyond that, you have people who may, might know about that. And so uh, the point I make is that like the further you can get into to something, uh, the more value you can extract from that. And, and I think it, it goes similar with like uh, maybe a meetup or, or um, you know, a, a technology or a concept, right? Like you could say, uh, let's take the concept of a meetup. Um, f for a long time, when I lived in the Bay Area, like the uh, San Francisco, it's called Bay Piggies Python Group was meeting and they're meeting like five miles away from where I lived. And I'm like, ah, why would I do that? You know, but like Guido, the creator of Python was there and it was only like, 10 to 20 people who would meet there, right? So I eventually started going to that, but I sort of like w regret not going to that earlier uh, just because uh, I, I find that like those sorts of activities where they're small uh, um, tend to have a lot of bang for the buck. But it, it was like my introverted side was like, no, I don't, I don't. It's easier just to stay home, right? And, and and these days we have so many things that can distract us. That's like I'll just watch Netflix or YouTube, right? Why would I go out of my way to 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 do things? But you know, if I'm on the periphery, um, that's not going to really 
give me like if i know the meetup exists that doesn't help me if i like read what happened at the meetup that might help me a little bit more right if i attend the meetup but don't talk to anyone I'm probably getting a little bit more out of it right if if i actually talk to people um then i'm starting to get network effects if i'm speaking at the meetup um then that's i think a nice hack that you can use where especially for introverted folks if, if you're speaking at it then you don't have to like come up with like uh, what am i going to say to this person right the people are coming up to you and talking to you so i mean that would be sort of i guess a hack that i or a power tip that i would give to people is um you know if if you want to put yourself out there you you need to get comfortable with the idea of of speaking or sharing with others. And I think forcing yourself to do that is a great way to do that. You're gonna, and then like finally, like if we're going with this onion ring model, like running a meetup, right? And it's not necessary that everyone needs to run a meetup per se, but um, the more you get into that, the more value you're gonna get from that. And then you're going to have people around you who are able to basically network and, and work with you that way, so. It's, it seems like you've really like flipped the equation on its head almost. I think so many people, what they are most scared of, they're most anxious of is meeting new people, not having anything to say, just this overwhelming fear of what does this person think of me, all of these types of things. And when you go and you're actually creating reasons for other people to come to you and be interested in you, that takes the pressure off of you to have any of that you know, angst about meeting these people because they have a reason to come up to you. It's not you're trying to break the ice. They are after your insight. They already know what what you're about. And there's easy sort of jumping off points for conversation. And to me, that that's something that's that's so brilliant because a, a lot of us, we don't really analyze why we have, for example, anxiety or fear about certain things. Right. Someone might just say, oh, there's a lot of people there. I'm scared of that. But just like you have layers of involvement in something, you have layers of reasons why you might be uncomfortable in a situation. So, you you know, you can walk around in a mall and maybe it's fine. So it's not just it's not the people. Yeah. Maybe there's something deeper where it's like, OK, um, I'm worried about talking to people. And it's like, no, I talk with my friends just fine. And then you go a layer deeper and it's like, well, I'm worried about talking with strangers. And it's like, well, in some circumstances, I'm okay with talking to strangers. I go to the grocery store, I talk to the to the person in the grocery, I go to the, to the bank and I talk to the teller. So, you know, maybe it's I'm scared of talking to strangers and not knowing what to talk about. And then you're like, oh, I can solve that individual specific problem. And that unravels all the other stuff. And I love how far you've taken it where you're like actually starting these meetups and it's like, oh, everyone has a reason to talk to you. You're obviously doing really cool stuff. You have these books, which are always a topic of conversation. You have the trainings, you have an interesting history, which are plenty of jumping off points. So sometimes it's just a matter of making yourself accessible to other people that can prevent a lot of the angst of meeting around other people. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of people, I mean, COVID sort of threw a monkey wrench in this, but um, I think especially these days, I mean, we just saw it like in the past week, large companies have laid off thousands, tens of thousands of people. And you, you have this notion that like, oh, I, I work at this big company or whatever. I'm, I'm basically protected and I don't have to worry about getting a new job. And, and, and we saw that play out this week and in, in that like, I saw multiple people saying, I, I worked at said company for 15 years and like I woke up this morning and my badge didn't work sort of thing. Right. So as much as we like to think that like our company has our back per se, I mean, it's great that people like working at their company, but your company is not your family and conflating like your company with your family and like thinking like, uh, you know, I I'm good to go. I think, uh, might be, uh, not the best mentality. And I think it's good to have what I would call it developer insurance or, or some sort of network insurance, right? Where, um, you know, if you needed to get a job, most of my jobs have come through my network, right? And so uh, much better to, to keep that network alive and, and functioning rather than like having to like stumble and, and be forced into like doing something that you might not want to. I, I could not agree more. I think 
it, one bright side is that the internet through LinkedIn, through Twitter, through YouTube, through all these places, the, the barrier for meeting people and creating a network is significantly lower. So, you know, I, I, you know, I work in tech, most of my friends are on the introverted side and they find it a lot easier to make a LinkedIn post or to, to do something like that, to grow their network or to net connect with people there rather than going out to meetups and meeting in person. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them are actually getting significantly more comfortable now that we're sort of through the, the thick of, of COVID going to some of these events, but that's enabled by the connections they've made on LinkedIn. Cause it's like, oh, I've met these people, uh, at least virtually, I know their stuff, I know who they are. I can go to this conference and hang out with them. I can meet them, I can meet their friends. It's, it, it eliminates the friction between meeting completely new people and having some familiarity with people. Um, you know, for example, I knew exactly who you were when, when I went to the meetup, I was able to say, oh, I know, like this guy has done X, Y, Z. I have things to talk to him about. This isn't gonna be awkward because like there's a presence I have, I can do a little homework and hopefully hit it off with someone rather than yeah. uh, just going in completely cold. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, I and I, I think like to that point, right? I, I mean, we have, this outer layer of the onion ring, which maybe you could say is like stalking, and that's probably not the qu quite right term, but I mean- if, <laughs> Researching. If, yeah, researching, <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of people, you know, are not going to post or comment, but like, if you want to start making, like turning these virtual connections into like a real connection, right? I mean, I would, I would advise move from the researching phase into like providing value, right? And, and that can be a post, um, that can be commenting on their post, right? Uh, those are sorts of things that uh, start providing value rather than just, I mean, if you're already sort of sitting around there doom scrolling or scrolling through their, um, kick it up a notch and that, that could help uh, get those things started. I recently released the course that I'd wish I had had when I was starting out in the data science domain. It's called the machine learning process from A to Z. And I partnered with 365 data science to build this. I also worked with my good friend, Jeff Lee, who's one of the most impressive data scientists I know to get all of the implementation correct. This course is special for a couple reasons. So first, it focuses on the machine learning process. So you go from ideation to data collection, to exploratory data analysis, all of the steps to building and implementing a data science project, it's all taken care of for you. We don't focus as much on the algorithms. This is all about getting a project out the door. Next, we've also open sourced all of our code and all of our examples on GitHub and Kaggle. Those are very easily accessible to everyone, including those people who just maybe want to see those and don't want to pay for the full course. In addition to that, we've included all of the resources that we use to build the course. So you're getting multiple different perspectives on every single concept rather than just our singular voice. Uh, you know, I view this course as one of the most valuable things that, that I put into the world and I'm excited to hear what you think of it. I've included a discount link in the description for the YouTube video, as well as in the descriptions on all the other podcast platforms. Well, speaking of posting and commenting, I think that there's something really valuable to unpack there. A lot of people feel like they don't wanna post or comment because they don't have expertise. They don't have a background that say, oh, like I know a lot about this, I can't post about it. And I think that that's a massive fallacy. So everyone has their own unique experience. I, I can't refute anything that you've done, right? I, it's like, oh, you've, you've had that experience. It's always valuable to share what you've experienced because that helps everyone else understand the possible spectrum of what's possible. And so to me, I, I am very hesitant to make broad claims. You should do this, you should do X, Y, Z. I am always comfortable saying, from my experience, this is what I've seen, this is what I've done. And people inherently get value from that. Whether you're the top expert or whether you're a beginner and you're struggling with it, someone can see your experience and at least bounce an idea off of that or say, does that validate what I'm saying? How does this change my perspective from where I'm coming from? Uh, and that makes content, people, all of this stuff a lot more accessible because you're not coming from a place of not being able to offer anything. Your experience, however limited it is, is still inherently valuable. Yeah, that's a good point, and and I think that's probably a mental hurdle that a lot of people need to uh, overcome and, and uh, figure out. I, I'd say another another thing that people are concerned with, or uh, maybe 
uh, stops them is maybe making you they think like making a fool out of themselves or saying something that's incorrect or being you know technical people do like to sort of one up other people that sort of thing and I, I guess my advice on that would just be you know what um, there's gonna be a once you once you get into the internet there there's there's uh, you can call it a bell curve or whatever of people and uh, you're not going to make everyone happy not everyone is going to be your friend right and so uh, you just have to live with the reality that like there are people who are haters and who won't like you and you could do whatever you want and and they'll uh, they're still gonna hate they're still gonna hate and and so i i think that's the reality we live in and i i think you do have to be aware of that it, as, as kind of sad as it is or whatnot but like you know a lot of people like for book authors they say don't don't read your reviews right i mean if you go out to your reviews you my reviews are generally good, but then you'll find reviews are like, oh, I don't like whatever, right? And, and it's like, there, there's nothing I could do to to, to change that. So uh, it, that's, I guess, a, it is what it is, right? And, and I guess the only advice I can have is, is like, realize that that's there, right? Just be aware of it. Like, it's not you, it's it is the world we live in. And if, if that causes you stress or consternation, you know, don't read the reviews. Um, but I, hopefully that's not something that's, that's preventing people from uh, taking that next step. Yeah. And I, I think that there's, there's so many levels to that as well. For example, choosing the medium is important for people giving criticism or negative feedback. For example, I find, you know, on YouTube and, and Twitter and Reddit, where it's a lot more anonymized, you get a lot of feedback that's just like, I'll get people are like, you look like ugly Elon Musk or like Chinese Elon Musk. And I'm like, I don't see that at all. Like, I don't know where you're, where you're getting this from. I, I think it's kind of funny personally, <laughs> but, but you know, you get things that are uh, irrelevant to the content that you're, that you're producing on LinkedIn. You're getting very direct, you know, responses and people have their job on the line. They have, their, you know, likeness on the line. So generally, they're going to be at least, you know, focusing on the content rather than you <laughs> throwing weird insults or compliments, maybe I don't know. Yeah, um, at you. That is a good point about LinkedIn. LinkedIn tends to be less anonymized. I mean, it seems like there are some bot like behavior so Pe people there but yeah and, and I, I would again you know if you're trying to build your social network uh, you know so you, people have different goals right but if if it is sort of to to have this like developer insurance so to speak i would i would advise not being anonymous on on those platforms e even though there are anonymous people um like i have a lot of people who follow me on twitter if some of these people who have, you know, weird avatars and names that don't make sense, uh, you know, if if I was at a conference, I I wouldn't be able to pick them out, right? But I I, I have people who are not anonymized, and like you said, I build up a relationship with them, and can meet them at a conference, and, and like we we're, we're not starting from from ground zero, right? We we already have interacted and. Um, and so there's some rapport there. Yeah. I mean, I, I also, I want to touch a little bit also on that feedback element where fortunately through a lot of volume and seeing a lot of mean stuff, but also a lot of really nice stuff, I've been able to like parse out emotion from <laughs> feedback. Like there's some people that give legitimate feedback in terrible, terrible ways. <laughs> and I like over time and conditioning, I've been able to say, okay, is this person saying this because they're like angry, they're upset? Are they saying it because it is legitimately constructive and there's something I can work on? Or are they saying this because they're just a troll and they, you know, they want to try to, to bother me or, or whatever it might be? Or, or, you know, like, do they, do they have legitimate chops to be able to talk about this? So, you know, if someone's coming in and they have no background in, in the data domain and they're saying, like, commenting on a, on a video of mine, like, AI is going to automate the domain, like you're stupid, whatever it is. It's like, well, 
<laughs> I feel like I hopefully have a more nuanced perspective than this person who has no background in this. You know, I'm probably not going to take that. I'm going to take that that feedback with a massive grain of salt. If it's one of my peers, if it's someone who's, um, you know, for example, I did a, a post on mentorship, how I would land a mentorship. And I think mentorship, to be perfectly honest, is like it shouldn't necessarily be transactional, but like the point of mentorship is that there's value created on both sides. You know, like I see a lot of potential in someone. Um, I'm willing to invest my time in order to help them with their career. And I would expect that they will become successful. And hopefully that like in the bigger picture, that goodwill or whatever it is back. comes back. Yeah. And someone was like, no, like mentorship should be free. Here's these places. And I was like, oh, actually, like if there are legitimate places where people are putting, you know, their their time in to, to create these free mentorship spaces, like I think that there's probably drawbacks. You're probably not going to get the exact mentor you want. They might not have as much time because they probably won't be as invested. It is still a trade off of value. Like they're getting a good feeling from mentoring people. But I'm happy to take that criticism because it's like, OK, there is value driven forward They're 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 speaking from their experience. Um, but over time, I guess, long story short, over time, I feel like you can like adapt yourself to reviewing feedback as long as you can very objectively look at it. And that's maybe where like data comes in, right, is where I look at everything as quantifiably as possible. I got a feedback that said I was using too many like weird faces in my in my thumbnails. I did a poll like, how do you feel about this? Ninety seven percent thought it was fine. Yeah. All right. So then, OK, I'm not going to make any changes. I'm going to keep things how they're going. Um, and that's a really good way to sort of, you know, quantify or validate if some of this feedback is, is legit. That's a great point uh, that like oftentimes the, the a lot of the feedback is sort of the the, the, we have the silent majority and then you have the vocal minority, right? Yeah. And I like how you said you t you actually looked at the data. Um, that's a, a good thing to take into consideration, right? It, if you want to sort of quantify what that feedback looks like, actually do it rather than, uh, you know, and if you think something is like valid feedback, right? I mean, work, uh, ask people about that, right? And get you know, work it out, right? Do, do these thumbnails really bother you that much, right? Uh, um, that sort of thing. I like yeah. that. Well, I, I think another side of that is having your peers, right? So there's a, a bunch of friends that are in the space. And if there's something that's really bothering me, like, did I, did I mess this up? Is this legitimate concern? I can bounce it off of people that I trust to give me honest feedback. I think that finding that group of people is very difficult because a lot of the time you'll just get people who will tell you yes and pat you on the back and do whatever it is. But I think searching out people that have your best interest in mind, maybe not your like local immediate best interest in your feelings, but your longer best interest in, you know, what you're producing, your, your, your are you going in the right direction? Are, are they willing to check you when you're, when you're not, um, when you're not going the right direction? Yeah. Um, that to me has been the most cathartic thing because it's like, Oh, I trust these people. They're very smart. Um, they, they're well researched. They have backgrounds in this as well. If it's cool with them, I'm not super worried. You know, I'm, I'm more concerned with what the people I I truly have connections with care, uh, think than the broader people on the internet who I have no connection to at all. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, legitimately, like I'll probably like if you look at like whatever my content on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. I'm probably going to say things that like might hurt feelings of people who are our programmers. Right. And I, obviously I, I have bias and that, you know, you also have to consider that people do have bias, right. Which impacts what they say. Um, and, and also take that as a grain of salt as well. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a, a, a truly important thing. So any model that we produce, the data that we're building it off of is going to have some bias. It doesn't mean we're not going to use these models. It's not, it doesn't mean we're not going to put them in the world. It means that we're going to put them in the world and we're going to hopefully make it clear to everyone what the biases might be so they can watch out for them as well. And I think that that's an important thing that to do with content is like, you know, they see who you are on LinkedIn. They see the, the, the story that you've lived. And if they're like, Oh, 
you know, this isn't true based on my experience, but like he's lived this very different life. He probably has some perspective on it. That's at least valuable for them to to be able to sort of balance that idea and say, okay, he's not just a random nameless, faceless account saying this. He's someone who's had legitimate real experience to be able to sort of uh, have examples, have case studies, have, have, you know, lived this rather than just declared it, which, yeah. which is in my mind, something that um, a lot of people should, should be doing more of, right? The more you create, the more you build, the more you work, the more story that you can build, the more you can sort of not rely, but the more that you can point back to your previous experience. And that allows you to have more credibility with any current experience, which is something I think you've done particularly well at. Oh, thanks. Um, you, you'd mentioned uh, a little bit about, I forget the exact term you used. I really liked it. It was sort of like networking, like hedging with your network or sort of like the the insurance. Yeah, the, the network insurance. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's also like tangible insurance that you can make. You, you know, you've written books with your knowledge. You've built things. You've done trainings. Um, there's this whole other side of of working in technology and having a skill set where you can build things. That means you can actually build things. You can build products. You can write books. You can you can create a financial safety net from the physical things that you produce into the world. Um, do you view that is in a similar way as, for example, the networking safety net, or is that its own category, or the networking insurance? Sorry. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I get. I would say that like my situation. Well, I don't. Mm. Yeah. If I look at like my income streams, they're relatively diversified, right? I, I do training, I have books, I do consulting, um, which, which might be a little bit different from a, a lot of people in the audience where they're probably like, I work at a company and that's where I get my income from, right? Um, so, you know, is, is it required that everyone diversifies their income? No, not necessarily. I, I just think like you need to like consider again, going back to that, uh, your company is not your family. They're reporting to the shareholders, right? And when the shareholders want something done, that that typically takes precedence over your job per se. And and so, uh, you know, when I, you know, a couple of times I've worked at companies where they've had stock and, and the company, the, the, the question was like, you know, do I exercise my shares? And, 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 you know, general feedback was like, well, it, you should, if you're like, if you're exercising your shares or, you know, or buying like the stock plan, uh, are, are you buying stock outside of that? Um, because you believe in the stock and, and I think you should like look at, um, you know, diversifying, uh, do you believe in something that you're going to, uh, involve yourself in it, um, it, the reasons why you're diversifying. So, you know, do, does everyone need to write a book? Um, I mean, for the most part, books are, as far as like passive income streams, books aren't necessarily great for passive income streams. Um, you, you know, general consensus is you'd probably do better like consulting or, or, or some sort of thing like that. So, but I, but I can say like a lot of my business, because I am in the training space, um, you know, those, those books help. And so, and so that diversification actually uh, helps from that point of view. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, and you can, I mean, I'm not a financial guru, but you, you look at like the stock market and, and it's like, you know, do you, you want to play the stock market? Do you want to pick one stock and put all your eggs in one basket? That might be good, right? Or, you know, you look at an example like NFTs last year, maybe that was good to do it with NFTs last year, but it's not good this year versus like the slow and like put it in index fund and diversify it. And that's doing the diversification for you. So I, I'm, I, 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 can't get enough. I, I really love this network insurance and I, I want to kind of build on it. So it seems like there's actually quite a bit of overlap between, for example, the, whatever passive income it might be, as well as the, the network effect, right? It's not just the people that you know, but it's also the brand that you've created, the, the network effect of the things that you put on the internet, 
right? It's it's not just, oh, I know Matt. It's that uh, I know Matt. I've also done this podcast with Matt and people have seen this podcast. And from that podcast, they might reach out to Matt and love what he had to say and 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 be able to go through and, and you know, work with you on any of these other things. That pure awareness is a network effect as well. And I think that not just people, but awareness of the things that you're doing is just as important or, or maybe equally as maybe not quite equally as important, but uh, it is very important for creating insurance, right? If people know who I am, if I'm in front of recruiters, if if they've seen me post on LinkedIn or if they've uh, been familiar with some of the projects I've done, if I lose my job, the probability that I find another job, not necessarily directly through my network, but through some offshoot of either my network or the the content or the brand that I've created, that's also at a, at a huge surplus that creates a ton of value for you. So I, I think it, from a big picture, it doesn't have to be necessarily like um, financial diversification or individual network diversification, but a combination of at least network diversification and like content and brand diversification, in my personal opinion, will carry you so, so far because it just creates those opportunity sets that you didn't necessarily know you had access to that can actually come to you rather than you have to go to that. Yeah. And I think a lot of, and going back to your point that like, this is my experience and probably your experience. And, and it's not, I'm not saying that everyone needs to go out and write a book or even post on LinkedIn, even right? post on LinkedIn. Right. Um, but my experience is that if you do that, that's going to grease the skids, right? If you need to get a job, um, instead of, you know, throwing out a resume, you can sort of slip in the back door, which like, if you look at getting a job as a funnel, you're like jumping several steps in that funnel by doing, doing those sorts of things. And, you know, even a lot of, a lot of these things can be just like hobby projects, right? Where you're, you're like sharing hobby projects. I, I think just putting yourself out there and putting what you're interested in out there, uh, can aid in, in greasing the skids or this developer insurance sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've seen it be valuable for me, right? My bias is that it's valuable for me. Um, and you know, I would, I would, I guess my advice would be, you know, find, find something that's easy, an easy place to start and, and start there. If, if someone's considering doing that. Yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of it is sort of introspection and understanding what the potential risks are of putting yourself out there. Right. So we talked a little bit about, okay, sure. you might have someone on the internet say mean things about you or, or criticize your work or whatever it might be. On the other side of that is you might get really valuable feedback back that makes your work better. Um, you know, you might also become somewhat of a public figure where you won't have as much privacy. Um, I don't think in like the data space or any of those places, that's a major concern, yeah. right? You know, I, I, I'm, got, I'm not getting yeah. hounded generally when I go outside by the paparazzi. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, at a data conferences might be slightly different, but at the same time, it's like you can choose to go to data conferences or not. Um, I, I'm a big fan of this, uh, this entrepreneur named, named uh, Alex Hermosi. And he had this, this conversation uh, or this sort of, dilemma before he started creating content like he was already successful before um but he saw all of the upside of having this this brand more financially for him um and i, I guess it is financial for people in the technology space right it it can provide some form of job security it can perform you know some form of uh, network effect that does get you more opportunities and gives you the chances to grow. Um, but this guy basically, you know, he's making millions of dollars a year doing well, but he saw the opportunity through producing content to 10 X that effectively he saw what Kylie Jenner did with a pure brand and some would argue not a whole lot of tangible skills. <laughs> um, and he's like, wow, if, if, if that is the power of what is possible with putting yourself out there, even if it's celebrity status, any of these things, for him, it was worth that trade-off. Now, again, everyone has to evaluate if the trade-off is worth it for them. But I very clearly decided that, you know, the trade-off for putting myself out there in terms of the value that I can create for other people 
in terms of, you know, there is a financial upside benefit, especially, you know, with any of the businesses that I have, uh, with being able to have access to really interesting people to talk on my podcast. Those are 100% worth any of the trade offs that that I've seen to date. Um, And, you know, maybe that's a fairly quantifiable way to think of things, right? It's like, is this, you know, I I literally made a list of like, is this worth it? Is it not worth it? Sure. Um, Yeah. And and you could probably go through and like, put the dollar amount there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And quantify it that way as well. You know, we're, we're talking about building these skills and, and sort of creating a, a path for ourselves. I'm, I'm interested in skill acquisition. So you've talked about um, training. Mm-hmm. You've also been, if I recall correctly, a university professor. Um, how does training people in a corporate setting differ from like a more traditional university path? Yeah. So, so clarify, like I, I do teach for Stanford online, but I'm not a professor. They, okay. An online they, te- they, a teacher. They, they, they'll they'll yeah. say that you are not a professor. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I wrote a blog post about what I, I, I called the, the best way to learn Python. Um, because one of the things that I get DM'd all the time is like, going back to your point, like, will you mentor me? Will you teach me to learn Python? Um, and just for those listening, generally, I don't, uh, my, my mentoring buckets are pretty full. So, so don't, don't DM me and ask me to do that generally. Um, but, uh, let, let me relate it with, with a story that I, I t- share in that blog post. Um, uh, two stories. One, one is that like, there is this, this guy that you probably never, you might've heard of him cause you're more into sports, but most people probably haven't heard of him. Who's a shooting coach and he's the shooting coach for Steph Curry and various other people. And you're like, why, why does like one of the best shooters ever need a shooting coach? Right. And, and, uh, long story short, you know, if, if you are a professional at something, you want to get better at it. Right. Like I like to ski, um, and I work on, you know, changing things in my technique. I watch videos about it, right? And, and try things out uh, because I want to get better at it. Uh, and I've had lessons as well to get better at it. And, and, and so anyone who takes something seriously is probably going to invest in that, whether that's a coach or, or something else, but they have, uh, skin in the game like i'm sure curry's paying his coach quite a bit of money right which again seems kind of weird why would you do that but um obviously they're getting value from that uh let me share another story um you know a person that i knew would come up to me frequently and say like hey i want to learn python i don't like my job i want to be a programmer i'm like great. Um, here's some options for you, right? You can go back to school, get a degree. You can go to a boot camp. Um, and this person was like, nah, that's too expensive or takes too much time. I'm like, okay. Um, I mean, here, here's my Python book. You can read that. And they're like, Oh, okay. Thanks. And then, you know, I'd keep seeing them and they'd be like, I want to be a program. Like, did you read my book? No, I didn't read your book. Right. Um, have you worked on any problems? No, I didn't do that. And, and so I, I think a lot of people, you know, say they want something that they don't really want it. Right. So, so to that same point, like Curry is paying someone to like help him do something that he's already good at. Um, but you know, people who want to acquire skills aren't, aren't willing to put anything in. So I, I think there is, uh, a requirement generally that you need to have some skin in the game. Right. Which is one of the reasons I, you know, you, you'll see like best free ways to do this. And obviously I'm biased because I make money selling stuff. Right. And I don't, I, I do have some free content, but I, a lot of my stuff is not free. Um, but I've also consulted for like, uh, s- software vendors who provide like learning management software for like large classes that were free right and i've actually looked at going back to data looked at the numbers of like completion rates of those and my theory is that if if people don't have skin in the game like they didn't pay for this 
course, right? It, maybe it's a Harvard course or a Stanford course, right? But it's like, we're just opening this up to the public because, you know, uh, the completion rates on those are abysmal, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so people are like, oh, I, I want to do this. Do they really want to do that? No, they don't. Um, th they'd like to have that on their on their resume or whatnot, but they really don't want to because they don't complete the course. And, and so going back to like, how, how can you make yourself complete the course, right? Well, um, have some financial incentive in there, right? I, I'm going to pay for this and uh, generally if you pay for something, you, you don't want to lose that investment by paying for that. Um, uh, so I, 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 you know, are there people who are, are self-motivated who can learn on their own? Yeah, certainly there are, but a lot of people do need something like a boot camp that they pay for or college education that they pay for to sort of get in there. Uh, I agree. I think, um, there, I think there's more than one ways to do that. I personally, like I have paid courses that I've created. Um, and we find that when people actually take the course and pay for it, they have a pretty high completion rate. Um, on the other side of that, I think that there's other forces that you can pull on that can give you a similar feeling. So something that I harp on tremendously is accountability. And so I, you know, a while ago, I created this challenge called 66 days of data. Basically every day you're producing something and you're talking about what you learned and the community is like, oh, this person's doing it. Let's help hold them accountable. And so there are multiple levers that you can pull where it's like, okay, I'm going to use all free resources, but I'm declaring that I'm going to tell everyone about what I'm working on. I'm going to finish it by this date. And if I don't, you know, people can, you know, say whatever they want to me about it. Yeah. I feel like that, especially combined with some financial incentive, and it doesn't have to be much. If you're paying $10 for a course on Udemy, it's still like, there's some hook that you've created um, that is is powerful. It's like, well, I bought this, I should use it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think obviously there are some courses, some trainings that are you know, like very financially intensive. You know, you look at a lot of the boot camps, and generally the boot camps have pretty high finishing rates because you're like, wow, I just dropped ten ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, you know, do I really think that the the information that you get in most boot camps is that much different than what you can get for, you know, a hundred bucks, 50 bucks, even free to be perfectly honest. Not really. Yep. But at the same time, you still have like, um, you know, you, you've created the system that does push you forward. Yeah. Um, I, it's interesting. I used to be someone that I like purely needed that financial incentive to get me to do it. As I've gotten older, as I've matured, like, I love learning, like, I will do it because I want to learn and because I'm interested. And I think people have to do a lot of looking in the mirror to say, like, am I what category am I going to fall into? Am I going to have to force myself? Am I have to use some of these like, outside leverage techniques? Yeah. Or am I intrinsically motivated enough to get there? And I think the intrinsically motivated people, they're probably already doing it. <laughs> they're, not, they're not wrestling with it at all right now. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. I mean, I, I see that you have books there, right? Uh, like deep work, um, never mm -hmm. split the difference, right? So good they can't ignore you. Those books weren't free unless you went to the library, right? I mean, so so I mean, you, you... I did expense them for for a video, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but like yeah, to to your point, like I. I I think you there is a lot of self introspection, right? And and you can you can reverse engineer this, right? Do I have a bunch of bookmarks or courses that I, I paid very little for, right? That I haven't completed, right? And if that's the case, then then I would say you're more of a hoarder, right? And and you're not going to complete those based on your past uh, behavior. So you you need to find some way that you will get skin in the game, whether that's like social media, where it's like, hey, everyone, I'm going to do this, please hold me accountable, or having someone who's going to tutor you and you're going to pay that person to tutor you, um, or, or maybe it's a live course, right, where there's actually people in there, so you're incentivized to come to it. Uh, I, I think that's one of the huge again, highly biased because this is what I do for a living. I, I like to say I sell snake oil and teach people to tell lies with data. Um, but snake oil as in uh, Python. Python. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. I, I, I guess maybe there's panda oil these days. I don't know. But <laughs> <Terrible>. um, <laughs> um, but one of the nice things about corporate training is that like 
a lot of these companies have like a building dedicated to training and you're going to be in the in the room you're going to be in the chair with other people and you're sort of forced to be there right and and it's not to say that like everyone needs to do that right some people are self-motivated and, and they can learn on their own but my experience is that a lot of people are not right and they need mm -hmm. to figure out uh you know if, if they're interested in learning or if they're interested in like career change or whatnot uh, what will work for them. For a lot of people, you know, college, a degree is great. Is it required? No, it's not required, right? Um, certainly I've worked with a lot of smart people who don't have degrees, but they do have that knowledge, right? So they acquired that knowledge somehow. Yeah, well, I think that this is really salient with that Steph Curry example that you brought up. So he's at the top of the game and he's still bringing in a coach to help improve his ability. And so something I find particularly interesting there, I mean, I work with a lot of elite athletes, is that what athletes are focused on is purely execution, right? They don't think about improvement necessarily. Like Steph Curry is shooting threes. He's not thinking about his form. He's not doing anything. He's in the gym, shoot, catch, shoot, catch, shoot, catch, shoot, drilling it, right? And that makes them incredibly good at what they do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that individually they can go in and innovate effectively well. So for example, a Steph Curry has someone else coming in to say, hey, these are areas that are outside of your radar because you're so laser focused sure. on this, they can help you improve. Same thing for trainings. It's like, this probably wasn't on your radar because it isn't in your normal line of work, but it's really important. It, it could be relevant to what you're, you're working on in your field. And you know, this is an opportunity to work on that a little bit and then go right back to execution. You, yeah. Like that mental energy that you're, that you're outsourcing to a coach is for elite performers something that is invaluable, right? Yeah. If, if Steph Curry was constantly thinking about his form, he probably wouldn't make very many three three pointers, right? He'd be like, my elbow here, um, <laughs> I release the wrist at this degree, and what, right? Yeah. Um, and and to me, th there's so many parallels with with the work we do. Is that you know if, if I'm running a business, right? I know a bunch. I used to think people who hired executive coaches and stuff they were complete idiots, right? A waste of their time. And then now that I think about it more, it's like, wow, I'm so busy executing in this business, having someone else come in and say, okay, like, have you thought about doing this? Like observing, I'm observing what you're doing. I'm, I'm taking stock. And like, this is an inefficiency. If I'm focusing so, so hard on it, like, I don't see the inefficiencies. I just see the work in front of me. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that that's a pretty compelling, um, you know, discussion about how people can improve and like what people are doing at the highest level. Yeah. I, I, I sort of two thoughts come to my mind when you say that one is that like in my training, right? A lot of people who I'm working with want to use like Python as a tool, but they're not, they don't have computer science degrees. They're not programmers. They don't want to be programmers. They explicitly say that. Right. So a lot of my job is like inadvertently or be discreetly behind the scenes, like teaching them programming best practices. Right. But also like filling in knowledge gaps. So it's like, like you say, sort of from the outside, I can see that you're missing these things. You probably weren't aware of them, but now that you are aware of them, that's going to make your game so much better uh, to do that. And yeah, and it could be, you know, hey, this person is a business analyst. They're using other tools. Um, they're really focused on dashboarding. And it's like, well, uh, if you actually write an R within, I think like Power BI, you can create fundamentally different visuals. And that's not on their radar because they would have to allocate time. They would have to not do their work and learn that. And having a training, having someone come in, having a coach, whatever it might be, you're able to really zone in on that thing and, and give them space to work on that rather than like detract from the actual work that they're doing yeah exactly yeah they're, they're and and i think the other the other thing is like you know does it have to come from training no it doesn't have to right i mean you can do groups of like masterminds or whatnot oftentimes and that's one of the reasons to like why do like meetups where you can like network with other people who are doing things similar to you it's just good to like expand your horizons and see what else is out there because a lot of times we are so like laser focused on what we're doing yeah oh so let's also talk about how people can you know we, we talked a little offline about how people can make improvements in, them, in themselves in their lives and a lot of this is or could be enabled with 
artificial intelligence, like there, there's this augmentation uh, approach. And I think people are just starting to realize how valuable these tools can be like ChatGPT. But what are, you know, why aren't people leveraging that as much as they could be? And what opportunities are there in, in sort of that space? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know that I can really say why they aren't using it as much as they could be per se. Um, I mean, my understanding is like chat GPT has like the fastest uptake of anything like ever, yeah. ever on the internet, right? Is like a million users in five days, something like that. Um, which is crazy. Uh, and I've, I've been, I, I would say tinkering around with chat GPT quite heavily. Um, and, uh, as an example, like for a uh, fundamentals of Python class that I do at the end of it, we do like a pretty involved project. It's not just like write this little class, but it's like, right, basically this Markov chain generator that will like, you can train it on data. It can download data from the internet. Um, and then you write a REPL for it where you can type in things and it will generate the text after. I mean, it's kind of like a very dumb chat GPT. And then we write like a command line interface to do that. So it sort of combines a lot of the Python skills that we talk about and we can sort of like, this is a bigger project, right? And, um, you know, I took that and I basically prompted my way through that, right? It's like write code that does this and, and it was able to do that. Um, not only that, it was able to write tests for it as well. Um, it was able to write documentation for it. And it was e even able to go sort of above and beyond things that I do. For for example, Python has this notion of uh, optional typing that you can put in into Python code. And it would, I could ask it to like take this code and now throw types on it and it would throw types on it. Um, so, you know, the ability to, um, prompt that uh, i mean the, the studies i've heard is that most programmers and again i'm sort of lumping in like data folks into like that programming realm even if that hurts their feelings but most programmers write 10 lines of code per day that's sort of like if you look at like broad studies they say that like you know we write 10 lines of code per day and which which is why like you know companies like google are like yeah, we'll give you free breakfast, free lunch, and free dinner because if we can extract whatever three more lines of code from you, it, it totally pays for for the dry cleaning sort of thing. Um, so, so I mean, if if you can if you can get an AI to write that for you, right? And it 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 takes my mental energy to write it versus like doing the prompt, having it write it is less and I still have more in the reservoir to do more. Um, I can see that, uh, being a huge game changer and, and I've, uh, been, been pretty impressed. Like I said, it, it, it's able to do that fundamental project and I've been, uh, playing around with it for other stuff like taking code, um, say Python code and say, write this instead of using Python, write this using NumPy instead, right? Or taking pandas code and say, instead of doing it this way, put it into a pandas chain. Um, and it, it does relatively well with that. Uh, so, so that to me is pretty impressive. Um, it's not just, not just that like, can it write code, but it can, you can also say like, describe what this code does to me. Right. So if I'm coming across some code I've never seen before, or a SQL query that I haven't seen before, or someone passes me some R code that I haven't seen before, I can throw it in there and it will like, tell me what it's doing. Right. So that's, that's pretty huge. I don't have to type. I don't have to like wait for someone to answer me on Slack, or if I'm in the office, go down and bother someone who might be in flow to. Uh, ask those questions. So that, that's a, to me is, is super powerful. I don't, I don't know if you've messed around with like code generation with that at all, but I have, it's been quite fun. And, you know, it sort of goes back to that expert using the coach perspective that we were talking about before, right? There's things that aren't necessarily in your realm. It would take mental energy to go research this, to try to do this, to experiment with it. And I think this augmentation allows you to ask these questions in a very direct manner think about it and process it relatively quickly and iteratively, almost like a coach would, right? It's yeah. like, hey, what, what, you know, it's not always 
I mean, coaches aren't always right either, but I, I think that that's fundamentally one of the fascinating things is it pushes you more towards the the edge or the limits of understanding rather than it necessarily, I mean, yes, it can start you off, but it, it allows you to take your analysis a step further. Yeah. So, you know, something I really like to do is every podcast, I mean, we had a little conversation a couple of days ago and we talked about things that'd be interesting um, and you learn about the other person a little bit. And that allows me to take the questions that I ask them or or any of the topics that we go into in the actual episode a little bit deeper, whether they're less superficial, we can sort of dive in and, and really get to the meat of things. And I think that that same power is present in how ChatGPT can help a programmer is that I fund I like know about this um, a little bit and I know I want to try and implement it, but this allows me to have a dialogue about how I can take it a step further yeah. and implement it. I think if you have, at least in the current state, these AIs, um, I would advise you to be highly proficient in what you're asking it about. Uh, for me, I see it as sort of like taking brain energy and like putting it on the AI rather than in, in my head, because these AIs are not afraid to lie to you and um be confident about that right and so they they can send you down the wrong path right and it's possible that they'll like say something that isn't correct but say it very confidently and so if if you don't know what's going on like you don't understand python you're just like blindly typing in this python code that's spitting out um it might take you down the wrong path so i i think from that point of view it it is you know, if right now, if someone's like, you know, can this AI teach me Python? Yeah, I think it can teach you Python, right? But I, I think um, right now I, I probably, well, I, I, I probably would say like, especially if you're starting off, make sure you have a sound knowledge of um, SQL or Python uh, before you start asking it things that you aren't aware of because you might sort of get yourself into a rabbit hole or dig yourself a, a, a hole that's a little bit hard to get out of. I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, I, I also, so where I see the biggest value is the differentiation between these tools and what like Google is, right? I go to Google to search for answers. I think ChatGPT and some of the other advancements are to not necessarily look for answers, but to further my knowledge. So one of the best use cases that I've seen for ChatGPT is in education, right? And so let's say I'm a teacher and there's a very specific example of, of something that I'm trying to create, whether it's with data, whether it's whatever it is, I can ask ChatGPT to create the exact example that I'm trying to describe. I can have it generate the data that I would want that would fit my example perfectly. I can have it um, you know, create the question set that would allow students to, you know, effectively understand this topic better. There's so much on that front where I see it valuable to teachers more so than students um, that I, 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 again, personally believe that there's, there's revolutionary potential on that side rather than just the pure consumption. Um, and I think so many people are wrapped up in the value of it for for learning and for for like the student side like mm -hmm. in telling us information that we don't see as much of the value in the generation and the actual ability for it to ingrain information in us more effectively yeah i think um yeah i i mean to be honest i i have used chat gpt for a lot of like brainstorming right i think it's great for creativity from that side I've used, I've asked it um, to uh, propose conference talks. Um, and I've had a conference talk uh, accepted that basically ChatGPT wrote. Um, so, uh, and maybe that's going to make people skeptical or whatever. But, um, but again, from my point of view, like, I've submitted dozens of conference talks and it's like, okay, let's, for me, it was sort of an experiment, right? Let's try this out and see how it does. Right. And it's like, yeah, that's a lot less brain power. I can do that in five minutes rather than two hours. And is it as good as mine? Uh, maybe, maybe some places it's better. Maybe some places it's not right. And if you know how to prompt and change these things, 
um, I, I think it, it can do a decent job. Um, so I, I, yeah, I do think, you know, th there is the question of like plagiarism and how students are going to be cheating with it. But I like, I like your point of like, Hey, I can, as an educator, I can say like, okay, I'm teaching whatever, um, slicing with Python. Um, what, and if I'm teaching a client who's in the financial industry, I can say like, okay, uh, what are some examples of how you would do this using financial data? Right. And you can ask it, like, give me the specific data sets, um, with the links to them and it, it will do that. Right. And it, and it might lie to you, it might suggest data sets that doesn't exist, but it generally does a pretty good job. Yeah. And I, again, I love the idea of data generation. Like it can generate data sets pretty effectively from, from what I've yeah, I haven't to. messed around with generating. I've just asked it to like point me to existing data sets, right? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Point me to existing data sets. Don't use, you know, Titanic or Iris sort of things. Um, and, you know, with URLs and it does it. So I'm, I'm interested in how you see chat GPT impacting maybe like the, the written side of things. I mean, you're an author, mm -hmm. is, it, is chat GPT a threat? Is it something that is valuable to you in that space? Yeah. Uh, people have different takes on this, right? I mean, a lot of people are like, you need to like, if you use chat GPT, you need to like list them as an author or have some disclaimer in your book or whatever. Um, I, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I mean, there's lawsuits going on about like code and, and like the legal ramifications because the licensing, like certain people are saying like this code, was GPL and chat GPT is basically like taking this GPL code and spitting it out. And I don't want my code to be GPL tainted, that sort what, of thing. What is GPL for those? So G, yeah, for, for those who don't know, like uh, light software has various licensing GPL is a, a free and open source license that is some would call it viral but basically if you use the gpl um in your project you are required by the terms of the license to release the source code of of your 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 project right which for some people works for other people might not work contrast with like an mit license or a bsd license where it's open source but you can embed it in code without having that viral nature of that and and so that's problematic if if you look at like github and you say like github has this repository of all this data or all this code and some of it's gpl'd and and these ais are training on gpl'd code is that tainting the generation such that uh what what's the legal status of that and and that that's that's being you know there there's uh a case uh in court going on with that i mean there's similar things with like uh uh image generation where people are like oh i here's my signature in this image but this image is like a dolly image sort of thing right so how, how does that so it's like the art are the artifacts part of the um, part of the broader, yeah. um, so, accreditation. Yeah. So, so, you know, if, if I make a book solely with GPT, am I really the author of it or not? Um, here's, here's my take on it. Currently I, I view GPT s sort of similar to, I would view like a grammar checker or a spell checker. Like I use Grammarly, I pay for Grammarly and, um, you know, it tends to do a pretty good job. Right. And it's, it's using technologies very similar to what ChatGPT is to uh, make suggestions, um, clean up your text, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so can you use, you know, can, could I, so full, I, I am working on a new book. I'm working on a book about XG Boost. Um, and have I used chat GPT in it? I'll, I'll say, yeah, I have, right? Um, where, where am I using it? Um, you know, sometimes I get to the end of the chapter and I'm like, I don't want to write a summary for this chapter, right? I like to put a summary at the end of the chapter, take the, take the text, throw it in there and write, write a two paragraph summary of this chapter. And, uh, 
Oftentimes I will do a lot of editing. And I think I think that's what, another key point about these AIs. Like you need to be an expert, I think. And because like I asked ChatGPT something about machine learning and it straight out lied to me. Um, and so if, if, if you're not an expert and you're like putting that into your book or whatever, that's problematic. Uh, but you also need to be an editor. Right. Um, and, and so you need to be able to edit whether it's uh, prose or code. And so I, I, I think the onus is on like, it's giving me this Python code. Is this Python going to work for me? It might work. I might need to change it a little bit. I'm going to edit it. It's giving me this text. Um, does this text work for me? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I need to change the voice of it or the feel of it and put it into my own voice. Um, I mean, so I, I, I think uh, what, what's going to be interesting is when I can give some AI, like, go read all my emails, right? You see how I, I respond to emails. Um, here's a new email, write a response to it, how I would respond to it you know, not just trained on, on the internet, but trained on my emails. And then I can sort of quickly say, yes, I approve that or no, I don't. Um, I, that's a huge time saver for me. Right. Um, and, and saver of like brain power, right. I can, I can use my brain to do other things and not spend it on, you know, 10 minutes writing an email. I can do it in 20 seconds. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting uh, in terms of like, let's say I have a lot of blog posts, I have a lot of videos, I have all this content on myself out there. Is it really plagiarizing or is it really lack of accreditation if I'm training these models on, your on my own, own information? Is it is it inherently different if I'm just, you know, I've, I have what, like probably at this point over a thousand hours of content on the internet. Sure. Uh, maybe Maybe that's not exactly correct, but... It, it, probably around around that mark, maybe a little bit less. But um, yeah, but if you like took all of your interviews, right, and you say like let's let's transcribe these if you don't have that, feed that into a model, and then you say I'm going to interview Matt Harrison. Uh, here's some background about him. Come up with some questions for him based on his background, and then based on questions I've asked yeah. in the past, right? So again, is it, what's, the, you know, I, as far as like provenance of like, you know, where that comes from. Well, I mean, you have these models that are like doing transfer learning, basically, where it's like trained on this large data set of the internet. And then you're sort of fine tuning it with your information on top of that. And I'm not sure, you know, again, from my point of view, this is my feelings, right? Like for me, it's like, this is a tool. Um, you know, it can aid me. I need to be able to do an editor and, and use my judgment about when I'm going to include it or not. Um, so, so that's my take on that. But again, not a lawyer. Um, the, the notion that like students are going to cheat on this with that. And, and I've seen, you know, professors and other folks are like, okay, these are my plans around that. I, I think, you know, trying to prevent that, that's not going to work. Like saying like, uh, you can't use that. I mean, basically what that does is like, I mean, if you look at like the, a lot of these essays, it's like, yeah, this, this essay is better than what 90% of high school kids can write. Right. And, and so if you say you can't use that and then the cheaters use it, they're going to, yeah, they're going to get good grades. That, that, that seems like a perverse incentive. I, I'd, I'd much rather like, uh, teach people how to use the technology and then, you know, you know, if they did use it, maybe they can have to say they used it or provide the prompts. I think that yep. se seems reasonable. But again, I think people are going to be moving into this editor role, expert plus expertise plus editor. And that, that to me just seems like it's going to like preserve my brain power to, to work a focus on other things. Yeah, I, I think I'll probably catch a lot of flack for the statement, <laughs> but I think a lot of the response to chat GPT in the classroom is educators and institutions not being willing to innovate, right? If the tools that we have are fundamentally changing how all work is done, right? If in 10 years, everyone's using something like chat GPT to um, write copy or do these things, 
the fact that we're banning it now, what does that say about us? If, if no one ever has to really like write a paper again, which could be a future that we yeah. live in, why would we not have them practice the skills that would complement that rather than essentially like creating skills that, that we won't ever need? You know, like for example, I had to learn cursive in like, like middle school. I have not written cursive in 30 years. What, what, what is the point of that if it's completely like innovated against? So my thought is, you know, could just writing a paper be something that is like cursive? I, I mean, I'm not going to go that far. I personally like writing and enjoy sure. it. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, we have to look at the direction the world is going. And if, you know, I, I think it's the responsibility of elite educational institutions or all institutions to try to keep up with this and allow students to leverage this rather than to rely on skills that that might be obsolete. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I think I think it's huge. I think, you know, this is like a shift from like horse drawn carriages to cars. Um, the cat's out of the bag. You're not going to prevent it. People are going to use it. It does a better job than 90 percent of people would do for a lot of tasks. So why not teach them how, how it works? Right. And, and education in the past and you know i do education um my i come from educators um but yeah to your point like i mean you can t even take this to like code interviews right like there's a sort of code interviews or this horrible thing that don't reflect what we do in the job right and it's like am i going to be whiteboarding in the job um probably not i mean sometimes i do like to draw things out because it empties my brain and like i can visualize things there but like that's not i don't have a whiteboard on my desk um and 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 so i i think it's sort of a similar thing where it's like yeah the the, the cat's out of the bag to me, this is huge. It saved me a ton of time. I think it's going only going to get better. I mean, just yesterday, I was I saw an article about uh, some Google researchers that had basically done like Chat GPT for music, right? And it's like write a song, this Gregorian chant with techno beat sort of thing. And it's like this is actually it's a banger, yeah. <laughs> kind of interesting. It wasn't horrible, and it's like I could see myself like saying write brown noise with you know pink floyd mixed with whatever right um latin pink floyd or something right but it has brown noise beats in it or something right and and have some music that's just sort of droning in the background that it's like my elevator music for working um that sounds pretty cool uh right and, and, and so rather than like saying these things are horrible or they lead to cheating. I, I think to your point, we, we should be like, be figuring out like how we, how we can leverage them. Right. And yeah. Do you need to learn cursive? Probably not. Right. Um, I mean, I kind of like calligraphy. I think that's kind of cool, but yeah. That, does everyone have to do that? No, I, I think everyone needs to know how to write because they're going to have to be able to edit. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but um or at least understand what it's saying and make sure that like they approve of what it's saying put their stamp of approval on it yeah i agree i was more playing a hypothetical <laughs> believe people people realize that i'm not against people writing <laughs> um I, I think what you mentioned about the coding inter interview for example is pretty interesting so you know something that i always think about is like what what is a more effective way to evaluate talent right if we're going to generate a linked list or something like that or like reverse a link to list, like, what does that actually show? If you were on the other hand to say, Hey, this is a generated code snippet. Tell me what's wrong with it. How do you fix it? Yeah. That to me is a very relevant thing I do with, you know, on the job every day is I don't know, like I, I borrow some code from stack <laughs> overflow. Um, I say, okay, well, um, this doesn't fit for my specific use case. How do I adapt this into this model that I'm building or yeah. whatever I'm working through? And that to me is something I do, you know, almost every day that I'm coding where it's like, okay, I have to integrate this generalized thing or this thing for a different use case into what I'm doing. Um, and, and I think that that's almost like a, a really good high level insight that, that you've described is that, you know, why are we quizzing on things <laughs> that are borderline irrelevant to work when there are far superior yeah. alternatives that 
are relevant to what we're doing. And I'm heavily biased again, cause I, I'm an educator, but, and, and like after like sitting through trainings with people after like the first half day, I mean, if I wanted to, I could like rank order people like from programming skills, right? It's pretty clear, like based on tasks that I give them, it's like this person understands this material is able to help others. This person doesn't. Right. Um, but I do think like going, you know, sort of recycling a little bit of what we said, like in the future, you have an AI that's trained on your code base. It's not just trained on uh, the internet, but it's trained on your specific code base. It understands it. And you're saying, I'm getting this error. I imagine that it will be able to say like, that's because of this. And um, can you forgot another freaking semicolon yeah. just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 ima I imagine that they will get to that point where, again, we, we, we sort of are driving this and maybe it's through voice or something else. But um, I, I think there probably will be a need for like caretakers or shepherds of the code. Right. But um, we might be creating that code a lot differently than than we do now. But we I, I think we do want experts around that code to make sure that it doesn't get out of hand or that these AIs are just spitting out things that we can't understand, right? Yeah, well, I've noticed a really interesting trend here. So we've gone from generalized AI. That's what's super hot right now. And inevitably, I think it goes to what we're describing here as personalized AI. So this big model is useful to, to everyone, but then it becomes even more useful when it's targeted for me and my specific use cases. I think we saw something very similar with like, quote unquote, big data, right? We went from, hey, massive data sets are what are really relevant to almost like small data where we have this big data and then we look at like an individual's hotel transactions uh, and we try to predict what type of offer to give them uh, as, as like Marriott or whatever it might be. And so it, it's really interesting to see a similar pattern or, or potentially a similar pattern in like more broad AI as we saw with the value of big data versus making small individualistic predictions. And I, I would expect that's the direction that a lot of these things will go. And it's kind of exciting to, to think about those prospects, also a little scary. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, some the, the a lot of these big companies already like they know what I'm going to do, right? They know where I live, they know what I buy, they know what I watch, they know what I search for, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, it, it would be interesting to and and potentially uh, interesting on positive and negative side uh, to see what what these sort of technologies could do, given given how much information they have on you. Amazing. Well, Matt, we're coming sort of to an end here. I definitely want to talk a little bit more about your new book on XG Boost. First, I'm just interested in what you find so exceptional about XG Boost and it's exceptional enough to write a book on it. <laughs> and then a little bit more where people can learn more about you sure. and, and, the, and, and the background there. Yeah. Uh, the impetus for the XG Boost book is, um, you know, like I said, I, I do a lot of training, a lot of predictive modeling training uh, and I, I think XG Boost is just in a good place right now where if you need to, uh, if you have tabular data and you wanna make predictions, it does a great job out of the box. Um, it has a lot of things that are, are going well for it. Um, and uh, Performance wise, it's it's really hard to beat. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, if you need to tune it, you can tune it. Um, tuning's not too hard. Uh, and so my book is is kind of diving into that, but also uh, going into some of the other features and ancillary libraries around XG Boost, like diving into Shap, how, how to use that. Uh, there's some libraries around feature interactions. How do how do you use those? And then also going sort of a lot of, a lot of, so as an, as a, you know, educator and author, I read a lot of content, a lot of the, a lot of uh, machine learning content sort of stops with like, this is how you make a prediction. And so uh, taking that a little bit further, like how do you integrate this into ML flow? How do you deploy it? How do you use Docker? How do you query that, right? So not just like using the notebook, but actually doing production with it as well. So sort of an end to end, start off by uh, talking about like decision trees, how those are 
the basis or the nucleus of, of that, build an intuition around underfitting and overfitting, and then sort of go through uh, what I think, based on what I've read and seen, uh, sort of the most complete uh, end-to-end uh, XG boost uh, introduction. So That's awesome. I, I, I'm a huge fan of using case studies, and it seems like the book is almost a case study of like end-to-end XG boost. And it's something where it's like, oh, I learned about XG boost. I learned about uh, like how to interpret it, um, like some of the explainability, how to implement all of these things. But that framework is something that you could almost um, take to any other model uh, yeah. if, if I'm interpreting that correctly. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, to your point, like I do use real world data. So I have a bunch of cleanup data. We're using scikit-learn pipelines. So it's not so, so again, it's, it's, it's not just like, here's your data, make a prediction from it, but it's like, okay, you've got messy data. What does the pipeline look like? How do you, how do you, and how do you deploy that in the real world? So incredible stuff. So Matt, where can uh, people learn more about you? Uh, where can I'll, I'll link, uh, your books and your, your social channels in the, in the description. But yeah. It, yeah. I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn, Matt Harrison on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, dunder m harrison underscore underscore m harrison underscore underscore uh, that's a python reference and then uh yeah metasnake is my company if people are interested in training or consulting around these topics amazing thank you yeah. so much my pleasure thanks again